As a beginner in this hobby, setting up your aquarium, <laughs> sorry, it's, it's really hard to say this with a straight face. <clears throat> as a beginner in this hobby, setting up your aquarium lighting is easy. <laughs> Wait, I got it, let me try this again. <clears throat> As a beginner in this hobby, setting up your aquarium lighting is easy. <laughs> I can't say that with a straight face. It should be easy, right? You buy the light, you mount it, you plug it in, and you're good to go. If only that were the case. Konnichiwa everybody, Matthew here, your BRS beginner guru, coming at you with episode 26 in the beginner how-to guide for saltwater aquariums and reef tanks understanding aquarium lighting. This is such a ginormous topic that we're breaking aquarium lighting up into three videos. Today, we're giving you the overview. Next episode, episode 27, we are gonna talk about the different types of aquarium lighting. And then episode 28, we are gonna give you the practical how to set up your light. Let me just be real with everybody for a second. Setting up an aquarium light should be easy. It really should be as simple as buying your light, mounting it over your tank, and plugging it in. You shouldn't have to know everything about PAR, spread, and spectrum to be able to be successful as a beginner because it's just too overwhelming. But since every tank is different and every hobbyist need is different, we're gonna explain a few things so that you have a better understanding. And let's jump right in with a quick discussion on spread. Simply put, spread is how light is distributed throughout the tank. Let's just use a flashlight as an example. If you were to hold a flashlight right near the surface of an aquarium, you're gonna get an intense amount of light in a very small area. But the higher up the flashlight goes, you're gonna have a wider spread, but it's gonna be less intense overall. So the distance away from the water is one factor that affects the spread, but just like with most flashlights, aquarium lights also have lenses on them. And check this out. A lens can be very, very narrow like this, or a lens can be very, very broad like this, so that's also gonna affect the spread. So the first issue you're gonna have when you buy your light is how high you should mount it. Generally speaking, the closer you mount it, the less spread, and the higher you mount it, the greater spread you have. The second spread issue is the fixture itself. Some fixtures have all their lights right next to each other. For example, take this Kessel, right? All of the LEDs are very tightly put together right in the middle, so you're not gonna have a huge spread from that. But there are other light fixtures that have a very different spread. Let's take, for example, your T5 lighting. It's a long tube, so the spread is gonna be pretty equal throughout your tank, but there's other kind of LED lights that place their diodes much further apart, which just means you're gonna get a much more wide spread. And the third factor involving spread is just the lens itself. If we again use this flashlight as an example, every LED fixture out there has a certain lens. And some of those lenses are very, very narrow. You know, they might have a 45, 50 degree angle, but other of those lenses have a much wider angle, maybe 150 degrees. So that's gonna affect the spread dramatically. I mean, are you overwhelmed yet? Because I know that I am, but you don't have to master all of this. All you really need to know is that when you buy an aquarium light for your saltwater tank, you may have to adjust the height to get the right spread. And if for some reason you are nerding out on this topic right now and need 18 minutes more, well guess what? You are in luck because Ryan made an 18 minute video all about spread. We will link it below. The second thing you wanna know about is spectrum. And when we're talking about spectrum, we're talking about good old Roy G. Biv. You got it, the rainbow. Different wavelengths of light appear as different colors to the human eye. The visible spectrum of light to the human eye is somewhere between 400 and 700 nanometers. But why do we even care about spectrum for aquarium lighting? There's really two reasons. The first is as it pertains to coral health and coral growth, and the second is just the aesthetic look of the tank. In the most simple terms I can possibly make it, corals need blue light to produce their food and to create energy. So don't just go to Lowe's or Home Depot and buy any old light. You need to buy a light specifically made for saltwater aquariums so you get the right spectrum for coral growth. Oh yeah, and if you're also nerding out on this topic, well, you're in luck because Ryan made a 15-minute video all about spectrum. Again, we'll put the link below. Next up, we have PAR, which is an acronym for Photosynthetic Active Radiation, and that measures the intensity of lights in your tank. And balancing the proper spread and the spectrum of your aquarium lights is one of the keys to obtaining the proper PAR levels. At its core, PAR really measures the intensity of light in the visible spectrum from 400 to 700 nanometers. 
And this is crazy important because the photosynthetic zooxanthellae that live in the tissues of your corals need this light to produce their food. And most corals get about 90% of their total energy from the light. If there's too much par in your tank, your corals will bleach out and they'll die. But if there's too little par in your tank, they won't be able to produce enough food and they will starve to death. So finding the right par level is really important for your coral health. So how much par do your corals need? A really good rule of thumb is to have 75 to 150 par for soft corals and for LPS corals, but to shoot for 200 to 350 par for SPS dominated tanks. And if you're a true beginner and don't know what softies, LPS, or SPS corals are, not to worry, we'll talk about that in a later video. So then how are you supposed to know how much par is in your tank? Well, you need a par meter, and these are relatively expensive pieces of equipment. So you can borrow one from a friend, oftentimes a local aquarium club will have one, or you can actually purchase one from BRS, keep it for up to 60 days, and then return it and just pay a $100 stocking fee. So it's basically like renting a par meter. I actually use one of these PAR meters from Apogee. It's a USB version. It's really cool because you just have to plug it into your computer and then you can check the PAR levels of all your tanks. Next up, we want you to understand what the photo period is. Quite literally, a photo period is the amount of time each day an organism receives light. So in your aquarium, we're talking about the amount of time your lights are on each day. That being said, we actually use the term photo period a little bit differently in the saltwater aquarium hobby. But that is because not all light is created equal. For example, if you're out at nighttime underneath the moon, yes, that's light, but we wouldn't include that as a part of the photo period. So in our hobby, the photo period is the amount of time each day where the light intensity is high enough to produce food for coral growth. If we stop and think about it for a second, most corals grow somewhere near the equator, which gets 12 hours of light a day and 12 hours of dark a day. But even though there's 12 hours of light each day, not all of that light is of the same intensity. The light is obviously gonna be most intense when the sun is directly overhead. So what we're trying to do in our aquariums is recreate the 24 hour lighting cycle that corals will find in nature. I wish there was an easy answer as to how long your photo period should be each day, but it's going to depend on you. When do you want to look at your corals? How much par do they need? And for how long do they need that par each day? If your photo period is too short, you may starve your corals. But if your photo period is too long each day, you may fuel a whole bunch of unwanted algae growth. Just for an example though, for most of my tanks, they turn on at 8 a.m. and they turn off at 8 p.m. But they have a really slow ramp up and a really slow ramp down so that the full photo period is only about five hours each day. Moving on to wattage, it used to be in this hobby that we talked about watts per gallon. So you figured out how many gallons your tank was and then you bought a light that had a certain amount of watts and poof, you had the right amount of par. But that doesn't work anymore. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's take 100 watts of a T5 fixture versus 100 watts of an LED fixture. T5 fixtures don't use energy as efficiently, so 100 watts in a T5 fixture is not going to produce as much par, but 100 watts in an LED fixture, which uses energy super efficiently, is going to produce way more par. So then the old norm of watts per gallon doesn't make any sense if comparing between different types of fixtures, but where watts is important is comparing between a similar type of fixture. If you have two metal halide fixture and one is 100 watts and the other is 150 watts, you can bet the 150 watts is going to put out a lot more light. The same is true when talking about LED lights. If you have a fixture that's 75 watts versus 150 watts, you can safely assume the 150 watt fixture is going to produce a lot more light intensity in the form of par. But to be totally honest with you, if you are gonna go with some sort of LED light or T5 fixture, really it's important just to buy the appropriately sized light. I wouldn't even concern yourself with how many watts per gallon or how many watts the fixture has. Just purchase a light that is made for the size of your aquarium and specifically designed for saltwater tanks and you're gonna be fine. Next up, we're gonna talk about shimmer and I love talking about shimmer because it makes me giggle to see all of these burly guys in this hobby talk about how they like to watch the shimmer dance off their corals. I, I honestly think it's fantastic. So what is shimmer? It's just a soft waving or wavering light. Think about it like this. If you have an aquarium light over a completely still tank of water, okay? Look at my face here. You're going to see some light. There's not much movement in that light, right? It's not moving very much at all. But if you agitate the water surface, all of a sudden that light starts bouncing around. That's shimmer. 
Some lights produce a lot of shimmer and some lights produce almost no shimmer. And to be honest, I didn't understand that until probably researching for this video. You'll hear people talk about Kessels all the time and they love Kessels because they produce such amazing shimmer, but that just didn't make any sense to me. I get it now, so let me explain to you why. It all has to do with how close the light source is together. A light source like the Kessel that has all of its lights very packed together is gonna produce a lot of shimmer when a light source such as a T5 fixture is gonna produce virtually no shimmer. And it all has to do with how shimmer is created. Shimmer is created when light passes down through the rippling water and it casts different shadows at different times down below. So if you just have a single source of light pointing down, it is going to cast shadows in all different directions. But if you have a light fixture like this, it's going to cast light over a larger area. So while light from this one section here is going to cast a shadow, maybe the light in this section is going to light that shadow so that you don't actually see it. So if your light is really spread out, it's basically going to make it so that you don't see the shadowing effect in the water. Thus, you're not going to see the shimmer. So if you want to get shimmer, the best way to get shimmer into tank is to buy a single fixture that has all of the lights in as tight of an area as possible. But if you don't want to see the shimmer, then the best bet is to go with something like a T5 fixture that has a million different points of light throughout the fixture. Okay, only two more topics to cover and we already brushed on this one and that is mounting height. How high you mount your light has no effect on the spectrum, but it does have an effect on the spread and the intensity of your lights. Each type of light is meant to be mounted at a certain height. For example, if you buy a light that has a very, very narrow spread, let's say the lens is something like 50 degrees, then that light is meant to be mounted much, much higher to achieve a wider spread. But let's say you buy a fixture that has a very wide spread, the lens is maybe 150 degrees, that light is going to be mounted much, much closer to the surface of a water to attain the same amount of spread. The normal mounting height for your lights is somewhere between 8 and 24 inches, which is quite a big range. I find the easiest thing to do is just to purchase or use the mount that is made specifically for your light because it will be the correct height. But honestly, to make it really easy, just check out this series that Randy made. He goes through light by light and finds the optimal mounting height for each fixture. And of course, we'll put a link to that series down below. Woo, I feel like I've already been talking for like 15 minutes, but we're finally on to the last subject for the day, which is controllability. The most simple aquarium controlled light out there is literally you just plug it in and you unplug it. A little bit more complicated than that is one where you plug it in and you have to flip a switch on and off. Then there are some lights that have built-in controls in the fixture that allow you to do some level of programming. And finally, there are the lights where you have complete control via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. When I look around at the eight tanks in my gallery, two of my lights have a simple on and off feature that I plug into a Wi-Fi strip so I can program the on and off time. Five of my lights are programmable via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, and one of my lights has its controls built into it, which allows me to program it as well. Honestly, they all work great for what they are. It just depends as to what level of controllability you want. What I'm about to say may sound completely counterintuitive, but I have found that too much control for beginners can actually be a bad thing. Not only will it be more difficult to set up just how you want it, but you're also gonna be way more tempted to play with the settings. And corals and anemones need stability to survive. And I'm not talking stability like an entire day or an entire week. I'm talking stability like nine months to a year without changing the settings. But not to worry because in our next two videos, we are gonna give you our recommendations and tell you exactly how to set up your lights. If this video today was just too complicated for you, don't worry about it at all. You do not need to be an expert in aquarium lighting to find success. But of course, stay tuned for our next two videos because we're gonna give you our recommendations on which lights to buy and how to exactly set them up for success. And as always, everybody, thank you for watching. Happy reefing, be well. We'll see you next time.